Greetings, parish orphans and retrogrades. Today is a Sea Mask Friday. That's good news for me. It's good news for you because it feels like about six weeks from the last Catholic masculinism pod that we did on I this channel. If you don't have an air conditioner, that is, look, There's everyone's excited. Minutes. We got uh, advertisements jumping in. Um, okay, <laughs> yeah, I, I was just saying this feels like so long since I've had. My friend, Dr. Michael Robillard, Elliot Hulse, Will yep. Noland, all, all, of, all of whom are my friends on the show. And today I want to talk about something slightly, dare I say, celebratory, gentlemen. I want to talk to you guys about moving the Overton window. I was going to call this uh, feminism moving the O window, but Steph was like, please, please don't. That, <laughs> that's, that sounds dirty, even though it's not. Moving the Overton window on feminism which is, there are marks of this. We're going to look at them today. It's something you and I, you three and I, have been working after for a period of uh, months and years. And there's some real markers that show that, that we're stretching it, along with a lot of other good forces, back to the right. So congratulations to, to you three. How, how are you guys doing today? Man, uh, only by the grace bad. of God, dude. I would say that like, I didn't even know what I was doing when I got married and living a traditional life. And it seems that uh, I, by the grace of God, like I said, I didn't really know what I was doing, but to see where it's come and where it's going now is like, it's right on time. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's like you, you get up every morning as a, as a married man and you're just like, I want to do things right. Doing things right matters more to me than it ever did before. And you're just like, well, lo and behold, I'm setting some sort of example. This isn't what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to be a decent father and husband. And it's making a difference. And then, Elliot, you're an entrepreneur and an influencer. And you've, I talk to so many young men that are like, dude, you have Elliot on, you know, you're not always on Rules for Retrogrades because it floats around. This podcast does. Like and subscribe. Click the notification bell, by the way, people. But every Friday we do this together and they're like, you know, Elliot was a huge influence on me, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago. So that people are watching, people are listening. Will Noland, Mr. Uh, fired for a masculinity speech. It, people are watching, people are listening. I, I remember six, eight months ago, around the time this podcast started independently, people were like, one of the coolest voices in Great Britain is this guy, Will Nolan. Do you know him? I'm like, know him? Yeah, I do do a podcast with him. And then Mike, Dr. Michael Robillard, I was shooting hoops in my driveway the other day for the first time in about a week because I had the summer cold. And um, I got the mail. My daughter got the mail. And it was some CDs. It was the Don't Go to College CDs. And I popped them in the audio book. And I li started listening to him as I was shooting free throws. And I was reminded through the opening chapter, which is our bios, auto bios, what strong evidence of anti-feminism and what strong life exampling that you give just from your example to young men, being a West Point cadet, uh, in your, what you wrote in your high school yearbook, you know? a life of glory and virtue, what you did after you came home from your service. Uh, it's a strong example to young men and it's a strong anti-feminist example. I'm like, man, I'm surrounded by some, so amazing gents so that, you know, we're not going to be doing all self congratulations, but I just want to say to people out there listening, these guys are the real deal. You know, I mean, we wake up on Friday mornings, I'm fasting on Friday mornings. This is, like they say in the movies with a strong actor, these are not just show muscles. These are, uh, these muscles do real work. I'm talking about my coffee because it's black coffee. It's real coffee. It does work. It, it gets me up in the morning, but these uh, handsome, strong gents I'm working with, these aren't just show muscles. These guys are doing in their sphere of life. These are, these are three of the very best. And I'm just happy to be doing this since it's a little bit of a self congratulatory show you know, what have we contributed to the Overton window? We're going to show you some instances in a sec. I just want to say, I really am honored to be doing this with you guys. And I really appreciate all three of you. 
and you, Tim, your big inspiration to me and to Elliot and Mike and everybody watching. Yeah, Thanks. Li likewise, likewise, well said. Thanks. It's just, look, man, I mean, we, we've done so many good shows. I was reviewing our topics actually with a, with a fan of the show. We're going through and I was like, yeah, we, man, we've hit all the right stuff. Now that Cobra Tate's back in the news a little bit, he's never really been out of the news, but people are talking about him again midweek of this week. And um, so I was like, oh, we've got, how many shows have we done? You know, two or three where we're kind of trying to give him propers, but say, here's how you improve. There's, there's, there's big fat uh, areas of overlap in both categories. And I was going through, well, we've done a lot of shows and one that needs to be done that seems specially relevant this week is, of course, what's going on. Well, you know, what, the anti-feminism movement. You could call it masculinism, but you could. What it really is is the anti-feminism movement and and the Catholic anti-feminism movement, which is almost non-existent outside of these boundaries. There's there's a Protestant anti-feminism movement to speak of. In the Catholic world, is almost nothing. There's traditionalism. But too often, that's um, that's been encroached upon as well. So what I want to say now is a couple things happened. Um, Ascension Presents in the Catholic world has these two videos that form, in my mind, very meaningful boundaries. There's one video. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna play you a clip from it in a second. Called. Uh, Submit to your husband, question mark. And it is by a, a, a very, what's the right word? Milk toast, normie, Catholic influencer named Jackie Francois. I've seen her, one of her talks when I taught at a high school, they brought her in. And of course, as you could guess, submit to your husband, question mark. She's looking at the screen like, mm, I don't like this. And she gives this talk and she's like, well, it, 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 it means what it basically doesn't mean what it says. And that's why it's OK, because the implication is feminism is good. And it's got like over 200,000 views. It's four years old. Father Mike Schmitz, midweek this week, did for, for also for Ascension Presents, a very large account, did one called The Truth About Christian Marriages. And then the subtitle is do wives have to submit? And he, he did the same thing. I'm going to play you some, some clips there. And what I, all I want you guys to do is to listen and to respond to the differential in the audience response, right? In those four years, something has clearly happened. And I'm not saying it's just this show or just the books I put out on it, but something is like really in the water. This is grounds for celebrating. So let me let me play Jackie Francois at first. When I play Father Mike, it's not going to sound much different, okay? But I'm going to just give you the, 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 the groundwork here. And then when you look to the comments section, that's what, what really heartens the soul. So here's Jackie Francois. Ephesians 5, sometimes we use it in, um, as, like a, as a weapon to say, oh, women, you should be like a slave to me. You should serve him like a slave. And really, it's like, no, this whole part of Ephesians 5 is not necessarily um, a cultural reference of how wives should behave with their husbands, but it's more of, in the catechism, when you look at these, uh, when you look at Ephesians 5 and you reference it, it's mostly about Christ and the church, that Christ loved us and he wants to sanctify us in, in the waters of baptism and he wants to nourish us with the Eucharist. So it's so beautiful. And when, again, when I think of wives submit your husband, have the, be under the mission. And again, this is for all you ladies who maybe you've dated guys who abused you, abused you, cheated on you. Ladies, never, ever, ever submit and be under the mission of a man who will do that to you. Okay? The mission that a man should have is to lay, to lay his life down for you. It's absolutely possible to have a husband whose mission it is to lay his life down for you. And how is that? How do you see that? Well, my husband lays his life down for me all the time. He sees, he anticipates my needs. And sometimes even before I ask, he knows, um, he, he knows what I need. I mean, when I was pregnant and I'm like exhausted or tired, he knows like, he's like, get her a glass of water. That's just something easy. Like he knows to love me, like get her, you know, honey, how can I help you? What can I do um, to make you more comfortable? What can I do to help with the kids, to help with the house? And um, this mission of a man who's tender, who's loving, um, beautiful, like that's the mission I want to be under. And that's the kind of husband I want to have. So when I hear this reading, it's like, why submit your husband? I'm like, I look at Bobby, I'm like, yeah, I will be under the mission. And because your mission looks like the cross and my mission, our mission together is to get each other to heaven, to have reverence for each other, to help each other be holy. Um, so you don't need to get the stink face anymore when you hear this reading, like 
oh no you didn't okay saint paul um, or or like uh, cringy you can be like wow this is beautiful and this whole scripture is in reference to christ in the church which means that you and i every single one of us whether you are married or single you are a priest and every single one of us the, our ultimate call is to be in union with god in heaven in the wedding feast it's our wedding with christ okay so just let, let, let's go through the the board here first if we'll go uh uh will elliot mike can we just I'm going to play you what Father Mike Schmitz said, and it's going to sound really similar, but I want to point out errors as we go. Did you have any responses that, to that, Will? She said a lot, and it's pretty much been the story since Vatican II on what they call Ephesians 5. Now, there are all these other passages that are just devastating that, that don't have any daylight to argue about, but... Can, do, you, do you have a few comments on how this is wrong? Just as we go along, we'll keep the audience up to speed. There's a lot of words, but there wasn't really much meat to them. The only thing I really heard was this idea that somehow submission is optional or yes. only if it is palatable to her or in particular situations. But the plain fact of it is that the husband is the head of the wife and wives must obey their husbands. This is in all things except sin. And what I was hearing there, sometimes explicitly, but sometimes just implicitly, but always coming through in the tone as well, yeah, was that that really grates on her and she's trying to find a way around it. <laughs> That's it. That's it. And by the way, you know, everything can be bifurcated conceptually, rights, duties. The husband has the leaderly rights and duties. All they do, I'm going to play Father Mike after everyone has a go around here, is be like, okay, well, I'm not going to say anything about the rights accruing to husband as leader, because that makes a woman sound like slave. But let's just focus on the duty. And I guess, like you just said, Will, I guess I'll just get square with it, because my husband's really good. He does his duties well. He goes above. He gets me water whenever I tell him. So he's kind of like my slave. This is the subtext. So it's fine that really his rights mean that I have to obey him. That, that's what's going on each time. You're going to hear it every single time. You hear one of the normies a little bit accepting, but mostly rejecting this. A Elliot, what would you hear? Yeah, a lot of what you said rings true. There's always this tendency to point out what the man must do. And it's very explicit, very clear. They want to point to it. They want to tell you what it is. But it's never, ever very clear what the woman's role in it is in it. And it almost sounds like, which I hear her saying, is that the man should actually be the submissive one. So the, the duty of the man is not to get you water when you're thirsty. That's, right. that's all, it's almost the opposite. Like, you should be making him a sandwich. <laughs> but she has it almost. So it's, very, it's okay to describe the man's <laughs> role as the, as, the, as the servant and as the submitter. But don't you dare place it in its rightful bounds around the woman's uh, 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 responsibility. But, you know, I just can't I, I always have to point out when they throw this trope of the cheating and beating. I don't know. It seems as if that's they, they pull that out of nowhere because it's I don't think it's as prominent as they propose. But it's always the first thing that they point to when it in terms of like why they shouldn't submit because husbands beat and cheat. And when you hear that so often, you tend to think that like, oh, it, this must be the norm or at least 50 percent. So a good percentage of men are cheaters and beaters. Uh, that's not true. And so they got to stop using that. Especially beating, especially beating, like literally. Where did I get this? This is how when I did a round of interviews with. I mean, I'm not using it as a negative, but 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 normier accounts, um, closer to center. You know, not not lefty Catholic accounts. I don't talk to them, and they're not honest. But just honest, good, right of center Catholic accounts. That's what I mean here. They all all of them borrow the far left uh, social justice warrior tactic of going to the worst case scenario, cheating and beating, especially beating. They're like, okay, well, Tim, you're a good guy, so. You're insisting on the church's teaching. This is four years ago, four summers ago, when I debated Trent Horn on feminism. I went on Matt Brad's show for the first time in the middle of the summer on feminism. And it like set the Catholic internet on fire. And when I was like, here's, I'm writing this book. My wife's writing this book. They're going to be cool. They're like, whoa, okay. 
Well, all right. So I know you, you're a good guy. You don't beat your wife, but what about the 99% of people that beat their wives? I mean, they, they didn't really <laughs> say that, but that is the attitude. Mike, right. I know you, 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 Mike might have some other comments, but this is a fallacy of emphasis, right? Among other things, Mike. It, yeah, certainly. Like, I mean, the, what I heard the entire time, I mean, in addition to the, the, the excellent points Will and Elliot pointed out is like the, the presupposition in the background is that of sex egalitarianism. And then she's trying to filter the entirety of uh, church teachings and Ephesians through that presupposition. So you can see here struggling to like kind of work it through that, that um, filter of, of sex egalitarianism. Um, that that's at least the presupposition that I, I heard. And it sounded yeah very muddled, very conflicted. Um, trying to make those uh, prescriptions uh, between husbands and wives like fit that particular mold. Right. That's exactly what I meant by fallacy of emphasis. It's mm -hmm. like, I have a really close friend who might be watching. And I say like, look, I'll believe something. I, I think the difference between us might be, uh, my friend knows who he is. I'll believe something if it's credible, whether or not it's, um, normy or fringe right whereas I'll, I'll tease my friend my very close friend now he'll believe it if it's i tease and i'm ex, i'm exaggerating because it's not true he's he's actually one of the smartest young men i've ever met uh wonder kind i i'll tease him you'll believe it based on whether or not it's fringe enough and you know that's the case whether or not it's credible or not and it is mainly just a joke but this is how it is for the for the feminists with the emphasis thing mike what you're calling, it all has to be run through the filter of sex egalitarianism, which is, of course, what Jackie Francois still had wrong through all this, even though she's sort of barely meeting par on, I guess I'll follow my husband. Will pointed out it's optional. Elliot pointed out her presuppositions wrong. Mike, you're pointing out her filters wrong. Her filter is, I guess I'll, I'll do it because I can still sort of sort of filter it through sex egalitarianism and we're like that's wrong even though technically what you said is right with the wrong tone barely the filter is 100 wrong because sex egalitarianism is wrong did any of you guys have any follow-up to any of those before i move on to father mike i just had a couple of thoughts from comments you guys were making one even saying you know anti-feminist catholicism is superfluous it's just catholicism i wouldn't describe tim as like an anti-feminist catholic he's just full-blooded catholic so we need to get that clear and people thinking mm -hmm. this is some particular movement that's like an add-on it's just what the church teaches and the next thing regarding domestic violence is that most of it is actually perpetrated by women and the more violent it gets the more likely it is to be perpetrated by women this is really politically incorrect data, but guess what? Women need to use force multipliers to do damage to men. So the more likely you get weapons involved, it gets up to about six times the rate of female on male violence. So even the whole narrative around domestic violence is massively controlled and misleading. Well, I, I mean this sincerely. I, I always love the stat. I'm like, man, I wish I had a stat for that. I'm going to go to Will. If I'm, I'm like, you always have them handy, man. That's so, that's so good. Thank you. I didn't know that. Is that true? Anytime yeah. you get the force multiplier, it will always be. I mean, it stands to reason. Six well, not times always. More. Six, six times more likely. Yeah, most studies show up to six times because they'll just like grab a saucepan or a knife or even worse, a gun. Whereas the, the, the men will tend uh, not to take things that far. I've forgotten the name for it, but there's this weird um inhibition pathway in the brain where men won't actually go full force on women if there's a physical altercation we just don't do it that's interesting and by the way when i'm giving you guys compliments these are absolutely real terms when you give real-time compliments like that's so special thank you thank you for your statistics i literally <laughs> always i'm like man i wish i had a stat for that and will's always there with it it's just it's legitimate gratefulness all of you, all three of you know who Father Mike Schmitz is, right? Just, can we just go around and check, check, check? You, none of you probably knew who Jackie Francois was, I'm guessing. But all of you know Father Mike Schmitz. This is the more recent thing. Yeah. 
Hmm. Elliot. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sorry. It's there's no way none of you wouldn't have because he's huge. He's huge on yeah. Yeah. YouTube. He's a huge influencer. Jackie Francois used to be bigger, but Ascension Presents is nearly a, a million person account, and they 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 present the the normie. And I don't even I don't mean center right here, um, like like a. a Brad or or Trent Horn, I, they're very they're very right center right to to be given the credit. Ascension presents is dead center, and they try to sort of scoop kids up in college, and this means that they're always playing way more favorable to the feminism than right center right. Um, you know, more more milk toast conservative Catholics that I'm calling normie cat. I, I don't mean that as a slur in the case of Brad or Horn, actually. Respect what what uh, Trent Horn's a good a good debater and a very sharp mind and 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 same thing with Matt Fred he's a sharp dude um, disagreed with him at times but that's different from how I'm handling Mike Schmitz okay this was this week and this was a big deal because the Francois clip I just played you is representative part whole it's a relationship of metonymy with the rest of the speech. And her audience loved her for it, loved her for it. Um, so she got no pushback. Now, Father Mike Schmitz said this this week, and he got so much pushback. This is four years later. Okay, I'm going to play a few clips. So again, there's, there's Catholics, there's Christians who are like, yeah, we're being adamant about this. Scripture says, wives, submit to your husbands. He's going to leave. Okay, he's going to leave. So I'm going to embrace that and be true to the Bible. Okay. Great question. Where's the Christian vision of leading? Like, what is the Christian vision of the one who's called to be the leader? Well, where do we look? We look to none other than Jesus himself. So Jesus is the head, we're his body. Jesus is the bridegroom, we're the bride. How does Jesus lead? Well, he doesn't say, I'm here to make the decisions. I'm here, I'm the one who's in charge. He says, the son of man, meaning himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So yes, husbands lead. What's leadership look like? It looks like that. This is just what you guys said. This is just what you guys is like two and a half days ago. Uh, Jesus didn't say, I'm in charge and I make the decisions. Uh, we'll, we'll keep the same order. Well, it, he, all Jesus did was, he came to die on the cross, but he's not in charge of the church. What? The church is subject to Christ. And you can see where he wants to go with this. It's the old mutual submission where there's no real structure of authority or hierarchy. And that's his vision of what marriage should be as well. But the truth is that just as the church is subject to Christ, the wife is subject to the husband. That's the bit that he's dancing around there. And Christ does make all kinds of demands on us. We have duties to him that we are obligated to fulfill. One of them is we're obliged to actually be in his church, keep the commandments, etc. So misrepresentation of what the actual teaching is there. You see this all the time in... RCIA classes as well, just trying to dodge what the plain hard truth of the matter is to try and make it more palatable to people, win them over by appeasing them and make things less offensive to their sensitive feminist ears. Well, that's what that that's what focus who's actually put out like a Bible study. I did a show on this about a year ago that has unadulteratedly i think it was on ephesians 5 same passage just propaganda uh, focus is catholic missionary at college it'd be better better off letting these people go another year and then get evangelized by some other catholic that's not hitting them with feminism feminist catholic is a false gospel it's like would you rather be arian or just a pagan for another year be pagan for another year if you're going to be feminizing it, because this is the worst, most toxic doctrine 
that you can bend and warp. And it looks like Ascension Presents is doing the same thing. What do you say, Elliot? You know, they, they always kind of break this distinction when it comes to break the distinction of responsibility and authority when it comes to the family. In every corporation, there's the CEO or the president. The buck stops there. And as a result, he has all the authority, all the responsibility, also all the authority. Same thing with a country, right? The president, he's got all the responsibility. The buck stops there. They'll point the finger to him if things don't go well. But as a result, he has all the authority. In the church, the same thing. But what happens when we get down into the microcosm of society, the building block of society? Why does, why does that distinction not carry through to the smallest elements of society? Why is it that he's, you know, Father Mike, and I didn't get to hear the whole thing, but he, as with the woman before and most normie Catholics, like you say, they, they're quick to point out the responsibility of the man to behave in a certain way. Like you need to serve, you need to give of yourself, but never do they mm -hmm. link it to the, the, the rightful equation of authority as well. You know, the, the, it's a very, it's, it's a popular adage that, you know, with, with great, with great uh, power comes great responsibility. I think I remember hearing that first, like in a, in a, in a Marvel movie, you know, Spider-Man with great power, great power. It's come great response. Everybody claps when they hear that. I'm like, oh yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. And they tend to forget that, well, it goes the other way too. Why is it so easy to say with great power? Oh, so you got great power. So we want to kind of squelch power. We don't like to hear about power. Nobody ever wants someone else to have power, but as soon as you water it down with what well, responsibility, well, I now accept power. Yeah. When it's, hey, responsibility, oh, yeah, sure, of course, yes, responsibility. But then power, no, nobody wants to hear about that. They're equal. They work together. It's two sides of the same coin. We can't separate them. Yeah, it's like they're using the second proposition to scrub the first one in, in uh, binaries, dovetailing binaries, aren't they, Elliot? It's like the second, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll seed the first. Yeah, you have rights. But we want to talk about duties really loud and like rights and duties come together. Your duties are there so you can have the rights. The, the rights are there so you can have the duties. Right. Yeah, it that, that that's a great insight. It's a great insight. Wait, Elliot, wait till you hear the next clip I have from Father Mike. But uh, Mike, wh what do you got? What what is what is really going on here with their their analysis? This this just reminded me of. I mean, just in general, what you've pointed out before about the um, Ned Flanders Catholicism and the misinterpretation of turn the other cheek being that the 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 only mandate of being a Christian is being this sort of self abnegating doormat in all instances. And this seems like yet another misinterpretation of Catholic teachings that results in that same hyper self abnegation right like that our our only duty is to just just always lay down and assert no um hierarchical values uh, or assertive values whatsoever because and then it's a very cherry picked um interpretation of Christ's teachings and sayings um without regarding other sayings and teachings uh that put everything into context so this just reminds me of like a uh like a particular instance of that, of a, of a turn the other cheek misinterpretation. What um, they're insinuating is you show up, you, you, let's say you've dreamed about getting a Ferrari your whole life. It costs a suitcase full of bills, 100,000 100, bills. They want cash. You show up on Saturday morning to go get your dream Ferrari you've worked hard for. And you have this uh, tongue clucking, like morality choir, false morality choir going, don't go do it. Don't go do it. What you ought to do, the Christian thing, is to give them your suitcase full of bills hmm. and then to walk away without your Ferrari. That's really what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you see it with money as well. Yep. Amazing. I, I, mean, I mean, like, that's what rights and duties are. Literally, we have all those responsibilities. And as Michael Knowles pointed out the last time he and I got together in, in Mississippi six or seven weeks ago, he was like, you know what's really funny, Sam? That um, all a man's really told to do in Ephesians is to love his wife. 
you get these throughout history, these really tough, coarse, world weary characters, men who actually used to do stuff right in the olden days. They used to do hard stuff. They'd come back really world weary and rough around the edges for the life. But all, all they were being admonished harshly is love them. You do have to be they're different from us. You have to be gentle with them. You really do have to love them. And it should be evident every day. You know, you might be rough around the edges everywhere else. That's fine, but love them. Women are told to respect. And I was like, that's a really good point. In Ephesians, mm -hmm. what's the difference? And, and Elliot, you're, you're big on this. Respect means you have to do everything the other person says uh, when it's uh, taken in its classical sense. Love just means what it sounds like, love. But respect means you have to do everything. So respect carries with it all these detailed instructions and admonitions. Love is less detailed. It's just like, you're, you guys are big, strong. You're going to fight the Peloponnesian War. Just come back and be, be gentle. We're, we're just giving you this general watchword. No, no details, right? It I think also that's insinuates hierarchy. Yes. Right? Love and respect insinuate hierarchy. Like love is poured out. What you pour it down, it, ch parents love their children, but children respect their parents. And, you know, I know that of course this comes from the book of Hulse, but it seems as if God so loved his loved us that he poured himself out in Christ. This is his love coming down. Christ, God always comes down to us in his love, but what's expected? Respect up. We pray up towards God. And so when that that imposition is shown in this particular verse, it also insinuates that now there's a hierarchy. Loving is not groveling from underneath. <laughs> Love is from a higher position and poured down, right? And, and I'm not saying good, like men are better than women, but they're above and thus the love comes down. To respect means there's, there's, something above me that I am respecting. You don't respect down. On that note, Elliot, there's a, a good passage from Pius X's address to delegation of the Union of Italian Catholic Ladies, which you guys can uh, find listeners in Tim's really helpful PDF on Catholicism versus feminism, just the sources. So I'm reading from now. And Pius X says that it is a mistake to maintain that women's rights are the same as man's. You hear that? Women's rights are not the same as man's. Woman created as man's companion must so remain under the power. That's what Elliot's talking about. Must so remain under the power of love and affection, but always under his power. How mistaken, therefore, is that misguided feminism which seeks to correct God's work? It is like a mechanic trying to correct the signs and movements of the universe. And what Tim is drawing attention to with this episode is that you can try and play a joke on nature, but in the end, you will always wind up at its punchline. People say how the Overton window only ever shifts left and it's like a ratchet and you can't ever bring it right again. But this has gone a few clicks to the right, as Tim is saying. Because what they're trying to do is so contrary to nature that human nature ends up breaking it in the long run. And that's what we're going to see. We've seen it time and time again in history with the failure of various socialist dreams and revolutions. They never work. The sexual revolution will go the same way. And feminism is a part of it. By the way, you could get this on timothyjgordon.com for absolutely free. Um, some people have called me and Will grifters for our new project together, which is return matchmaking. Go to retvrn.us if you're interested in Catholic matchmaking. They keep calling us grifters, but what I what I figure is I give so much stuff away for free. People trads are sometimes like, we can't afford your book, The Case for Patriarchy. We can't afford Ask Your Husband, Steph's book. Okay, fine. So we did is we compiled our bibliographies. We called it Just the Sources. It's a 30 page PDF. And we're like, just take this. We'd rather you have the free thing. We can't give away everyone a free book, but this is basically what you need. And don't forget the, the honest normies out there that are like, Tim, Ephesians 5 has been interpreted by John Paul II in a 
in a, a genuinely, genuinely bad biased way. Uh, after two millennia of real interpretations by the Church of Ephesians 5 going in the direction we're talking about, they think that's the only place where submission is mentioned. It's not. Colossians 3, verse 18, submission. Only it's unilateral wifely submission. 1 Peter 3, verse 16, unilateral wifely submission. Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, unilateral wifely submissiveness. Uh, the quality of submissiveness attached to wives. First Timothy chapter two, verse 11. Uh, that one's thorough. That's probably the most convincing one, way more convincing than Ephesians five. These people only know about Ephesians five and are countering it desperately, not effectively, not convincingly, but they've trained all their fire there and they don't know they're all these back channel ones. First Timothy chapter three, verse 12. In addition to first Timothy two, verse 11. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 3 through 7, this one's gangbusters. Uh, wifely submission is unilateral. There's no other even arguable place in the New Testament where they could come up with some lie like mutual submission. And then 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 to 35. Let me play you some more Father Mike clips because your guys' your guys' comments have been amazing. <laughs> Go through the wheel. This is, it's going to make you mad. Just be, be prepared. It's him talking about just lead, just lead. That's all men want to do is lead. It's everything we were just talking about. He really drives it home here. Sure. Lead, lead him. Yeah, just lead him. Like, okay, that means I got that. Like, I'm in charge. That means, okay, I'm going to make the decisions. Yeah. You know, Brides will say something like that. Like, yeah, I guess that means that, you know, he makes the decisions in the family. That means he's in charge of the family. No. Is that what it means? It I will you take this, but I just want to point out what he's saying is so incredibly subversive because he's not even talking about the 95% of Catholics that already have the, the bad feminist toxicity soft wired in. He says brides who have the right idea on this, the one out of 20 or probably more like one out of 50 that have the right idea will say, well, my husband's just in charge and she's prepared to go accept that. He's like, uh, uh we need to undo this is what I hear him saying. What do you hear, Well, That's really subversive. It's not optional. This is part of the nature of the marriage contract. It's actually built into it. You owe your husband obedience. This is, again, coming back to the relationship between Christ and the church. It's not up to us whether it's a good idea to submit to Christ or not. That's what the whole arrangement involves. So to get married is to submit to your husband. And I'm sorry, but even when he's not living like a saint, which is the reality for most husbands, because we're all dealing with original sin, we're making mistakes, etc. We've got our flaws and faults. That doesn't mean you can say, well, do you know what? I'm going to submit three days of the week but not the other four, or you've annoyed me this morning, therefore no submission. It's actually about submission to the hierarchical structure, not just the individual husband you're married to. It's about marriage itself. So you'll hear women say things like, um, if he leads, then I'll follow, or if he deserves submission, then I'll submit. And I can see why they might be psychologically frustrated with a man who's not doing his duties well, but all you're going to do is make it worse if you then say, I'm not going to honor the marriage contract as a wife. You're just going to introduce more chaos into it then. Uh, Trent Horn recently did a thing where he's like, okay, some trads out there, he meant me, will say, um, you know, wives have to follow their husbands unconditionally. And this seems, he, Trent's gotten hip to it. This seems to be scripturally well, well founded. But will these same trads say the same thing liturgically with their bishops? And I'm like, yes, I'm the trad that after Traditionis Custodis came out, I made this exact analogy. I said we can't do in the realm of liturgy, even though I'm a TLM all the way guy, we can't do to our bishops what feminist wives do, semi-feminist wives do to their husbands vis-a-vis -vis prudential judgments. We can't say, well, we'll follow their categorical judgments in cases of Malam and Say. But 
all prudential judgments, which might lead to something bad, I'm going to defer to my own judgment. We can't do that. I don't want to go to the Novus Ordo, okay? But Pope, Fra Pope Francis has the plenary authority over sacraments and disciplines of the church. That's so, so we're stuck with bad liturgy if he's a tyrant, which he is. It can get changed back the other way. But I made this exact analogy when I debated Tim Flanders on the liturgy. I said, we can't be like feminists. It sucks, but we have to follow it. Women who have a, a, a crusty husband, as long as he's not ordering them directly to sin, you have to follow every even prudential judgment, even if it might lead indirectly to bad things. What do you say, Elliot? Yeah, that's a really good point. I heard somebody say this this week. I forget the context, but it was that democratic democracy is demonic and that it was never we were never meant to be equal in any regard, but it's the predominant attitude of the day. No one ever wants to submit to anybody for anything in any realm. And that's why we have such chaos because everybody's their own authority. Everybody's their own God. And, you know, you guys know better than me, but I, from what I understand, this country was not even founded on so-called democratic values. It's just, that idea has just been pumped into our brain for the past hundred years that we take it for granted, but it's a republic. I, I know you wrote a book about a republic. Uh, it, there's there's a leadership. There's a, there's a hierarchy. I mean, I don't, I don't exactly know how it works, but I know that we're doing it wrong. And that the, 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 the idea of this flattened out, everybody's their own uh, imminent ruler has got us into the chaos that we're in right now. But as we were, as he was talking, you know, I was thinking about this wife who does submit and, you know, he was making whatever comment about her. I didn't totally understand, but, you know, for those who are listening and I'm talking particularly to the guys and you don't want to get into a situation where many years down the line, you're in a marriage and then you want to confront this issue. I think as a vetting, part of the vetting process, a part of your courtship needs to be pull out the Bible and point out these uncomfortable passages, particularly these ones, and ask your potential wife, what do you think about this? Don't wait till you get into a marriage and then have to say, well, uh, what do you got? What do you think about this? Or maybe I need to step up and start leading. Or is it okay if I become the leader? No, this needs to be established very early on. Otherwise, do not proceed. Young men, did you hear that? Absolute rule of thumb. A rule of thumb so absolute, just call it a rule uh, from the book of Hulse. Do not get married without the, you know, we've said it on other shows, the shit test of saying, here are these eight scriptural passages. You might throw in Ephesians, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Ecclesiasticus as well, uh, book of Sirach. But go through Ephesians 5. Colossians 3.18, 1 Peter 3.16, Titus 2, verse 3 through 5, 1 Timothy 2.11, 1 Timothy 3.12, 1 Corinthians 11, 3 through 7, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35. Don't do it on a first date like you have Asperger's. You <laughs> look like a weirdo. Don't do that. Do it one of the last times before you're thinking about popping the question. Okay? Do what Elliot just said. Uh, Mike, what do, what do you think about Father Mike's last? I... <laughs> I can't make heads or tails of what on earth his motivation is to to be opening up this question. And the, yeah, he says, I, I don't know. Are you in charge? Are, are you the leader? I mean, would would he be happy with with a lay person in his parish going say, I don't know, are, is the priest in charge of the parish? I don't know. Maybe, maybe he isn't. You know, let, let me get up on the uh, on the altar and, and, and start uh, running things. Right? I mean, I, I would imagine he would put his foot down and say, wait, no, there's, there's a chain of command. There is um, a hierarchy here. So I don't know why he's throwing out these really destructive and subversive questions into the, into the internet ecosystem. I, I don't know. I have no clue what his motivation is. Which is weird because he's as milk toast as you get, but it is like subversive subversion. Yeah. It is yeah. extra. It's remarkable. I, I don't know what the motives are because like I said, he's addressing the one in 30, one in 40 women out there that are like, no, my husband's in charge. I'm, I'm proud to have him in charge. He's like, is he though? <laughs> right. What? Yeah. WTF yeah. father, by the way, 
Yeah, Elliot, you're, you're dead on about America is a republic. The difference between a democratic uh, uh, regime and a republican regime is precisely what you, you pointed out. A republic cannot be a proper republic under God, cannot be subverted. It is squarely oriented at the natural law um, in Federalist 39. Federalist 39, uh, uh, Madison describes a republic as um, having a Senate, which gives the cool and deliberate sense of the people, meaning it's a deliberative process, meaning there are some natural law virtues that cannot be subverted by direct representative government, i.e. democracy. We'll just put it to a vote. Is abortion okay or not? Just put it to a vote. 5149, say yes, it's okay. No. A republic can say, it's 1973, more than 51% of the people would go for abortion now, but we have a, a Senate, a Senate Tory process, a second house to bestow this cool and deliberative Republican sense of the people they will regret it later if they trust themselves. So there is hierarchy and authority in a republic. Mm. There's not a democracy. Everything you said was dead on. I just didn't, didn't want to leave that hanging. Um, Thank you. Okay, you're going to get, you guys, I hate to piss you guys off on a Friday morning, but it, it gets, <laughs> I'd say, arguably even worse. Maybe not worse than the second clip, but he builds on it a fortiori. Here goes. Like people, guests at the wedding are looking back and forth. Like, did they actually, there's Catholic. Guests at a wedding. He's criticizing those who, like many of my young former students um, who have Ephesians 5 read at the wedding, he's making fun of them in a low-key way. And he's saying guests at the wedding will be, they'll be perturbed by the word of God. That that you ought to either silence it or change it is the implication. YouTube, there's Catholic Twitter, there's Catholic, all these things. And there's this kind of like this rise and people talking about, yeah, that's what we do. Here's what it is. Husbands. You are leaders. You lead your your wife. You lead your family. Men be leaders. And I'm all about men taking responsibility for themselves, making men taking responsibility for the people around them, people that are under, under their care. But what does it mean to say, okay, guys, you need to lead. You need to lead your family. You need to lead your wife. You need to lead her. And also she needs to submit to you in all things as to the Lord. Like, what does that actually mean? Great question, Camper, because I don't think it means what you might think it means. In fact, let's go to the beginning. Okay, number one, don't call me camper. Two, two other things, right? I, I don't I don't appreciate that. Two things. What they did, Ascension presents, is they trotted him out here. I want your guys' feedback here. They trotted him out here after four years. They had Jackie Francois on the exact same channel doing a video. So no one believes in wifely submission. Why is it in the Bible? Um, to great acclaim. Now, in those four years. There have arisen voices on Catholic internet and Catholic YouTube, which you heard him mocking. He means me and us and those like us. Books like Case for Patriarchy and those like it that have arisen. He said it's become popular. So they sent him back out there. They thought his video would win the acclaim that the Francois video won. Secondly, you hear a direct intoning, a direct expression of that which we only heard insinuated before in the first clips of. Him cherry picking husbandly duties, you get the duties, but not the rights. He said, he said it outright there. He's like, I'm fine with the duties. I'm not fine with the rights. He he said, it's not a direct quote, but he said basically that. Will, what do you say? Imagine being a Muslim guy listening to this. You give it a giggle, wouldn't you? It reminds me of that meme where you've got the guys in the middle of the desert and the top one is a zoomed out clip of his face and it just says, Abdul. And then it zooms in and he says, get the rocks. Like it's time for a stoning. This is how weak the West has got. And if husbands are actually questioning whether they really have any authority over their wives, they're really questioning the whole heart of patriarchy. And to be pumping this out online from big outlets that are supposed to represent Catholicism, that's embarrassing. It is. Get the rocks. Get the rocks. What do you say, Elliot? I, I agree, um, yeah. like a million percent. You know, there's this attitude that all leadership and all authority must inherently be bad and be evil, mm-hmm. and it seeps right into this. And that that idea is squashed when you read the chapter in its fullness, and it says somewhere to something to the degree of treat your wife like a part of your body. 
So to be the head doesn't mean I'm now going to abuse my body and I'm going to do what's best only for my head, but not for my body. If the, if the man is the head and the wife is the body, then he's going to take feedback from the body. The head doesn't do anything without considering what does my body need? What does my body want? Good leadership in all regards always asks what is needed. The head will ask the body, what do you need food? Do you need warmth? Do you need, what do you need? Do you need to be washed? Do you need to be uh, tempered? Do you need to be controlled? Like sometimes the body is out of control. It goes both ways and it goes that way in these types of relationships. With my team in my business, if I charge ahead without considering what the guys that work for me think, I'm going to miss the boat many times because they have great ideas. They got their boots on the ground. They got their finger on the pulse. And so I have to look to them often. I often look to them because it's helpful to me. Uh, a leader in any organization is not just going to charge ahead as a tyrant, not considering the body. And so the same thing in my relationship. Yeah, the buck stops here. Ultimately, I'm going to be held responsible. So I'm the authority. I have to make the final say. And my wife understands that. But I don't go charging ahead without asking her questions or getting her feedback or being curious about her position on things. I may or may not take that to, and run with it, but it's not like I'm blind of my body's needs. Well, Elliot, on that body point, it's really interesting that these guys who think they're being loving by not actually exercising any authority. If you're letting your wife get obese, for example, you're not loving her because loving is about willing what is objectively good for the beloved so these guys who are afraid to have tough conversations with their wives like or oh, maybe you should eat a bit less or exercise a bit more etc so you'll be healthier this is what i want for you because i love you it ends up with them when you lose the leadership you also lose the love there shouldn't be a, a split between the two to lead is to love that's what it really entails it's what women are actually built for and people who are backing away from that that's just yet more abdication of authority, which is part of the curse of Adam from original sin. Men need to fight hard against that, not be encouraged to go slack. Mm. Mike, what do you say? And I'm going to, I'm going to snake in reverse. So, so Mike, you'll get first, first bite of the apple um, for the next, the next couple of passages. Roger. Yeah. The um, yeah. Just, just back to, to what you said and what, Elliot said what I heard there was yeah he said um you have this responsibility to lead so lead and you have to ask well how well how how can you lead if you've all or how can you tell these men to lead if you also told them that they have no responsibility or that, that you have no authority that corresponds with the responsibility so yeah it's once again it's yeah lead you have a responsibility to lead parentheses but you don't have the authority and i i don't see how those things can coherently hang together you know he, he, you the only way you can lead effectively is with the authority to do so and that comes part and parcel with the responsibility and it's it just seems like he he he's not acknowledging that <coughs> by the way the goal is not coherence that's not how it works with huge accounts who are being dishonest. There are good accounts that are that are ginormous, like the Daily Wire, that have done good work. Uh, Walsh and Knowles have pushed the thesis for the case for patriarchy explicitly. They've actually been popularizing it. That's a big account that's doing good work. Uh, Matt Frad is a, a big Catholic account that has... Um, I'm going to play you a clip from him on this. He actually says, look, Tim Gordon persuaded me. And he's, he has a history of doing this. He'll, he's a big account. Big accounts want views, but he'll actually reconsider things that are overly normal. He'll say, no, I have to take an unpopular stand here. Uh, right. He doesn't do it all the time, but he is, has a history of doing it over the last four years that he and I have known each other. So I want to give, I, I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the dead center ones that are pure democracy. Wherever 51% of the crowd says we'll go, we'll go, even though we're supposed to be leading like a republic. Um, Ascension Presents is one of them. Their goal is not philosophic coherence, Mike. Their goal 
is just one bite of the apple. They know their audience isn't critical. They're not going to hear, they're not going to print the redaction. 10% of the population reads a newspaper redaction five days later when it appears on the back cover. All they see is the first page of the paper, gets everyone's impression, makes all the negative uh, reputational uh, 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 effects, and then boom. And then only, and then 90% of them will never see the redaction, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, they, they're not trying to be coherent. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's very important with the way that big accounts work when they're not using their authority wisely, when they're abusing their mm -hmm. authorities, talking about cheating and beating the too many big accounts cheat and beat too many big accounts don't realize what elliot said that that with great power comes great authority it's ironic because they they sound like they're the guardians of this they're not okay listen to this clip again sorry to sorry to make you mad but on early on a friday morning the beginning earlier on in Ephesians chapter 5 i think it's verse 21 saint paul begins this whole section by saying be mutually submissive to each other out of reverence for Christ. So be mutually submissive to one another out of reverence for Christ. He goes on then to, uh, that, that's just uh, the lie of, of mutual submission. The word mutual never appears in the, the scripture in any, yeah, any. He's making stuff up. They're making stuff up. It says, and it doesn't, <laughs> the good, the preferred translation of Ephesians 5 verse 21, it's 22, 23, 24 that you're like women. What this means for you partitively is you have to do everything he says you be submissive in everything he will submit his life in situations of grave peril that's what it says so it's partitive in some sense everyone is being subject to each other women submit everything men submit their lives um that's the partitive sense it goes on to say he goes to ephesians verse 21 and he's whereas the normal english translation is both of you be subject to each other. Subject means thrown under. Man throws his life under the bus if need be. Women throws her what autonomy she thought she had when she gets married under the bus. Man's in charge of everything. And it's very, very clear. Couldn't be clear. It says, okay, in some sense, everyone is being subject in some way. So it's partitive. He's saying, here's the actual quote. It's mutually submissive. No, JP2 made that up. It's be subject to each other. And um, he goes on to, I, I couldn't play it much longer because it was driving me crazy, but he goes on to give a false etymology that they all say. Jackie Francois was using it four years earlier. It goes like this, submission. Let's do an etymology on this. And they say sub, that's a Latin word, a Latin prefix. That means under. Mission. We all know what that is in English. So you're under the mission. That's not how etymologies work. You take <laughs> the Latin for the base word too. Okay, submettere. It literally means to put or to place under. The woman puts or place herself under her husband's authority. Um, there's a lot there, Mike. What What do you say? This just reminds me of um, thematically that uh, that be a man book that I mentioned that uh, uh, by uh, Father Larry uh, Larry Richards. Yeah, where the analogy he yeah he makes the uh, he says. Um, Oh, you, you know, you, you say that you're, you're a man and that you would, you know, you would potentially like die for your, your wife, but you're not man enough to do the dishes for what type of man are you? Right. So it's this, it's this like bait and switch of, you have all these manly responsibilities. Um, so now let's like disregard natural law and how you're purpose built and like flip them and say, well, if you're, if you're willing to go to war and provide and protect, but you're not willing to do the dishes and do, you know traditional domestic female things what type of man are you it's like wait a second like that's a really really weird bait and switch and it is. i feel like there's a very similar but i mean you can see how that like how that thinking kind of gets pumped with um that that initial analogy uh it seems like there's something similar going on here with respect to father schmitz father larry richards is one of the og catholic feminist people one of one of the post-conciliar godfathers of fifth wave feminism. But yeah, you're exactly right, Mike. It's like, you might be man enough to go put your, put your ass on the line in war in Iraq or Afghanistan, okay? You, you think that's tough? <laughs> Try wearing a corset. Are you man enough to wear a dress for your wife? And we wonder where 
effing tr- gender dysphoria came from. Mm-hmm. It came from feminism. They're yeah. asking, are you man enough to do the dishes, to wear a beautiful dress, to have a, a, a period or a baby? It's like, that's a woman thing. <laughs> what are you talking about? What do you say, Elliot? Right. Yeah, I, this is a tough one, man. It, they spewed his garbage all over the place. Are you man enough to be vulnerable and cry? Are you man enough to to cut off your penis and get shot so you can become a woman? That's basically the the logical conclusion of all this. Are you man enough garbage? Mm -hmm. It is. But the point that I want to make that with regard to that last piece was this is the problem. This 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 personal interpretation of the Bible or taking things out of context or making up your own words. This is what Martin Luther wanted to do from the beginning. It's a it's it's a very subversive. A, a, a tactic that has caused a split in the church. Like this once again proves that you need an authoritative body. You need an authoritative <laughs> text. You need the church's traditional teaching from the beginning. And I don't know, you know, a part of what I love about the faith, the Catholic faith, and m- my wife also too, She, my wife likes order. She likes structure. She likes authority. And so she really took very quickly to the faith when I introduced it to her, because she's like, wow, everything is very clear. Everything is cut out. There's not very much wiggle room. That makes me feel safe. And that's her attitude. But within the church, we still have all this perceived wiggle room. And these people who are having conversations, changing topic or changing words and putting things out of context, never really going like, why doesn't Father Schmitz go to the authoritative documentation of the church and what popes have been saying for, you know, the first 2000 years of the, of the faith, or like go to the catechism, like what, why, and how is it that you can be a Catholic, even wearing the priestly collar and insist that I'm just going to make stuff up. This is, this is it. Does that destroyed us from the beginning, from the time of Martin Luther? From the That's time really of Satan, point. really, in, in the garden. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Well, I was just going to say it's a really good point because it it's similar to what we were saying earlier about how just because the the husband isn't perfect, that doesn't mean that the wife gets to reject the authoritative structure. And what you see with the Reformation is like the closest thing you can get to Christian feminism because the papacy is patriarchy. Pope literally means Papa. And the sentiment there was, well, this is kind of like a bad Papa. This is a bad husband. This is a bad leader of the family. Mm. So we're going to reject the hierarchical structure. We'll reject the authority. And that's the equivalent of the wife who says, are you really in charge? Are you acting the way I want you to? Are you really in charge? No, I don't think so. I think actually I'm in charge. And now I'm going to make up my own church. The wife or the priest who says that. Husbands, are you really injured? Think of how symbolic this is, Will. So Ascension Presents, to my knowledge, has now had two people in about five years come out and question the authority of the husband. The priest, who, who's probably marrying people on the side, saying, is the husband really in charge, though? And the wife, who's going, is the husband really in charge? Symbolic, this is not my point. One of my patrons pointed this out to me. Who's, whose voice is not being heard there? The husband's according to Ascension Presents. It's literally the subversion of having like a priest and a wife being like, Psst, the husband's not really in charge, even though it says this. I find it very, very off-putting, not just misleading, not just cowardly, very misleading. And where I want to go with this is that I, I, I think me and Will were talking about it off-channel independently. Go read the comments if you want to feel good. If you want to have an angry day where you start out wrong, listen to these father, five Father Mike Sch- uh, Schmidt's quotes. I have one more from this 10-minute video. It was full of bad stuff. You want to feel good about your day? Go read the comments. Two out of three of them. Someone pointed, my, my friend Andrew pointed this out to me. Two out of three of them are like, uh, no, Father Mike, you need to pray about this. This is wrong. This is wrong. The husband's in charge. I was like, I don't know what to say. I'm without speech. As someone that always goes to worst case scenario, always thinks bad stuff are going to happen. That's very encouraging. 
Uh, listen, listen to the last bad clip I have from him, and then we'll go to some people admitting they've been changed on this. Mm. Some people even choose to have at their weddings. Here's a scripture that sometimes people in the Bible in a year, or even they're just stumbling through the New Testament and they come across Ephesians chapter five, and they hit this line that says, wives, be submissive to your husbands and all things as to the Lord. And all of a sudden, just like, whoa, what is happening? In fact, when that comes up in the lectionary, right in the cycle of readings on Sundays, sometimes it's just like, what is happening? What are we going to say? Even there might even be an option to like skip it or to like go over this. When people choose it for their weddings, all the, you know, I sometimes see this. I sometimes see this confusion of like people, guests at the wedding are looking back and forth. Like they book. actually, there's Catholic YouTube, there's Catholic Twitter, there's Catholic, all these things. And there's this kind of like this rise and people talking about, yeah, that's what we do. You guys, you guys heard the latter part. I just wanted you to hear the, the first part of that quote. I, I was focusing on the latter part, uh, it, which went on earlier. But the first part is him saying that the censorship, the the modern censorship, 2,000 years into church history, into the life of the organism, the members of Christ, is a good thing. And it's not maybe that that passage is hard bracketed out in the lectionary. It says you don't have to read this. It's in hard brackets. He's saying it's good. He's smiling about it. And he's like, I think it's there. You know it's there. Because you're saying that you as a pastor, you're admitting you're cowardly and that you dread it. He he admitted it. He said, oh, you dread it. Because you see people looking around. My point, my point has always been, gents, we'll go Mike Elliott well. This, that men are in charge and women have to follow, this doesn't even count as one of the hard sayings in the gospel. Gospel, uh, Bread of life discourse, right? John, whatever, chapter six, when Jesus said, look, you have, to, you have to eat me. You have to consume me, body, blood, soul, divinity. They said, this is a hard saying. Mm. And many of the 5,000 left him. Judas went off and turned it over to the devil afterwards in like verse 70, it said that. People don't talk about that. That's one of the hard sayings, the Eucharist. Trinity, three persons, one substance, one Uzia. That's, that's a hard saying. Jesus, one person, two natures, right? Hypostatic union. That's a hard saying. Um, transubstantiation of the Eucharist, a, a conceptually separate doctrine about the Eucharist that makes it difficult. Men are bigger, stronger, uh, uh, when we're talking ceiling, not floor, uh, smarter than women, just equipped for leadership, all the things you would ever need. That's not a hard saying. That's just nature. Just go watch the Olympics. You don't, they're not Catholic. They're secularists. They push feminism, but even the feminists at the Olympics bifurcate the sports. Even the feminists who like female sport, pro-female sports, they're like, we do not want men in the sports. Men will kill them. I thought you're feminists. So, Father Mike is talking about this. I don't even think he accepts mutual submission in Ephesians 5. He says, let's talk past it. Let's censor the church. But even if you're willing to accept it, he's calling it one of the hard sayings. It's not even one of the hard sayings. It's the most obvious saying in the Bible. What do you say, Mike? I remember you pointed this out somewhere, and I thought this was a really good point, where you said that... um, you can pay attention to what people like say they believe, but if you really want to know what they believe, like see what they get, they, what they get embarrassed about and what they take pride in. And he sounds almost embarrassed that like, he's almost apologizing that somebody would stumble across these lines. And all, we, you know, we all know, we all know that, you know, Catholicism is really about sex egalitarianism. How did this line get in here? Like, boy, isn't this, isn't this embarrassing? Let's move on. Uh, so it, it just seems like he's, is embarrassed about church teachings like that's what it's not like like he's preemptively apologizing about uh that line and right. I, I i don't know where that's coming from well the church is supposed to convert the world the world is not supposed to convert the church <laughs> and people the, the world has converted the church on feminism and and we're trying to undo it to a little bit of success what do you say uh what do you say elliot 
Well, you know, I caught that last piece where I think he's saying that people are starting to revere this verse more, particularly in their weddings. Like this is something that's trending. And I know that's a probably a segue into the rest of our conversation, but man, that feels so good to know that regardless of what the talking heads are saying or what's been popular in the milk toast media, uh, that at the grassroots, the trad movement is taking hold. I, I even watched Bishop Barron the other day talk about, uh, you know, why men are leaving the church. And whatever your opinion of Bishop Barron is, I, I really like the fact that he's willing to take a measured approach on a lot of things. And he's like, it's because we watered it down and we've turned everything really weak and nobody wants to propose anything that's tough or that's challenging, or like, you know, you're saying here, a hard verse. And the reason, the way back is already unfolding, but the way back is a return to these hard things. Men want to hear these hard truths, especially if they put them in a position of responsibility and authority. So the what gives me good, gives me hope and, and excitement to see how the next maybe decade is gonna unfold for the faith, uh, it's very evident that we're coming back to the truth, we're coming back to what's hard and we're taking it with a, we're taking, we're taking it with, you know, that masculine position that has been required and lacking for the past 60, 70 years. So good. What say you, Will? It's a show of weakness and weakness is always going to invite attack. This is why appeasement doesn't work and why the culture is in the mess that it's in because the faith ultimately built Western culture. And there's a time lag between the two, but when you get a crisis in the church, eventually it ends up producing a cultural crisis. And this is the heart of it. It's about whether men are actually willing to stand up and say, this is what the church teaches. This is putting it bluntly, just natural law. We can know these things without revelation. It is also revealed just to make it crystal clear, but we can know all this without revelation. Like Genghis Khan and similar bros throughout history weren't sitting around arming and ahhing about whether the husband is the head of the wife. They were just like, duh, this is obvious. And we need to actually return to making that clear. Otherwise, you're going to turn more and more men away from the church and compound the problem. I put on Instagram a while ago that St. Benedict smashed the pagan idols in Monte Cassino. St. Boniface chopped down their sacred oak tree at Geismar. St. Patrick defied the droids to light the paschal fire on the hill of Slain. And the barbarians were watching this and just thought, wow, this is great. They were converted by the displays of strength. And right. until men actually return to making a stand for the authentic church teachings, all they're going to be doing is making people think, what a bunch of cowards. Why would we want to be involved in that? But all three of them risk death to actually make the point of this is what's true. And that was inspiring. So it's going to start as pathetic as it sounds for modern culture, but with guys just reaffirming the basics in their own households. And then it will just filter through from there. And that's how you change society, family by family. That's all it takes. Just reverse course in your own household. You don't have to have your bishop's permission the way we do have to have it now, once again, to get a beautiful traditional liturgy. You can't do anything about that. You can take over your own household, and that's much more important. Now, the good news on a Friday morning, I have two more quick clips for you guys, and then we'll let everyone get out of here. But the good news is, in fact, go read the comment section on this Father Mike video. He got so much pushback. I, it, it's, and it's, it's charitable, but it is strong. Um, kind of a bloodbath, but a loving Christian charitable Ned Flanders bloodbath. They're like, no, father, no, this is wrong. You still get the one third of boomers or people that were influenced by boomers saying, I like this. Now I now I feel okay submitting a little bit to my husband because I'm really in charge. But the other two thirds are the ones saying, no, father, this is wrong. You need to pray about this and, and come correct. Some people just said, you know, case for patriarchy or something like that, which is which is always fun to see. Now, one of the people our age and we're, we're all pretty close in age that we've known about for a long time a big newsmaker who's done some really good pro-life work 
she's right at our age, is um, Lila Rose. She's one of those more in line with Ascension Presents kind of center normie, maybe even center slightly left rather than Daily Wire or Frat or something like that, who will just sound like a boomer, like you're you're 40 or something. I, I don't know how old she is, but she, you're around 40, but you sound like you're 65. Sound like your boomer parents who gave you this pack of lies about Ephesians 5 and whatnot, or the prelates from their time. How did you get that? Well, um, we did a show, she did a show, and then I did a show responding to it uh, about, about like the feminism issue. And it was really, really interesting. It was about some some woman that quit American Idol because she's like, I just this will this will ruin me being a mother. I just want to go home and pursue my dream of being a mother. And Lila was like, Well, you can have both. Don't you blah blah. And I'm like, You can't. Good, good job, lady. Go home. Like, <laughs> good job. Um, you made the right decision. She had a really amazing voice, by the way. Um, but <sighs> So we did shows on that. And then she was, she wasn't in the comm box, Lila. Oh, but she was tweeting at me during the show. So I think she was watching. And I was like, look, let's come on and talk about it. She's like, Tim, you misunderstood me. I think we agree more than you think. And I'm like, okay, we're diametrically opposed. Then more recently, she's been saying stuff. It doesn't fully reflect that she gets it, but she's trying. Given the reductionist, materialist, determinist point of view she expresses here, She's trying to get why stay-at-home moms, and and I guess with it, submission is a good thing. Listen to what she says here. It's 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 a start. It's reductionist, materialist, determinist, still quantifying moms' efforts economically. But listen to what even Lila Rose is saying. She was pretty far on the other side before. Evaluate the economic value, the monetary value of a stay-at-home mom who's doing all these different roles and looked at, well, what if you had to outsource it all? Outsource the shopping, the cooking, the cleaning, the home organization, the errands, the child care. It would cost up to $200,000 a year. I think the number was 170 to 200. So the economic value of a stay-at-home mom, it's like $200,000 for all the things that she's providing for her family. Now, all those things in monetary terms, yeah, that's a lot. But what she's doing is far more significant than $200,000 worth of work. For a mother, your children are your most important work. You alone are the mother of your children. And that's why being a mother is the most important work. What do you, what, what do you say? Well, she's, she's struggling to get it and, and looks like she's fighting the good fight and coming around. This also was just this week, by the way, all this flurry of, we're seeing some work product for, for all the elbow grease and sweat and blood and tears we put in. What is the main point of her comment there? I can't quite tell without the full context, but it seems like she thinks that it has to be valued in monetary terms. It can't just be valuable as that is the fulfillment of what it means to be a woman. That's what I was getting from that clip. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I think at the end, she tries to put the bow on and make it all kind of like, well, it's not just the economics, but she's, she talks for a great time by saying, look, stay at home moms, they matter too. We shouldn't beat up on them because, because they're really worth 175. It's like, yeah. do we have to do that? You, you're missing the point is that they're they're priceless rather than it's not about valuing them in terms of x amount of money it's that you keep them out of the economic marketplace because they're too good for it that's the main point that's not something you need to say oh and here's uh, something to make up for it the, the point is that we never want them in there at all but i like i love when women do the two-step they'll be like Women are priceless. I love that, William. Thank you. Thank you for saying so. <laughs> They're priceless, but precisely to the value of 175000 a year. It's like that's <laughs> priceless means it can't be quantified, lady. But but thank you for trying. Uh, play again sometime soon. Elliot, what do you say? You know, in a world where women constantly complain about being objectified, don't objectify me. Don't objectify me. They're constantly turning themselves into objects. Right. Be it with the clothing that they wear, they don't want to be seen as objects, but yet you're objectifying yourself. But now with the the communist idea that you're worth what your labor is. And so once again, uh, the, the cry is always don't objectify me. But now here in your your most valuable asset, you want to put a monetary value to it. You want to objectify it now. 
So it's, it's, it's a contradiction of values. Don't say you don't want to be objectified and then turn around and objectify yourself in this regard. What say you, Mike? Yeah, I guess the same, same general thought. I think that, you know, trying to bring this like utilitarian calculus to all facets of the human condition, um, we end up in this, this sort of space and, um, yeah, it's just wrong headed, um, for all the reasons that Will and, and Elliot just mentioned, you know, it just turns out that there's some features of the human condition and of the good life and of the good that aren't quantifiable and they're not easily collapsible to this kind of utilitarian calculus and um where it is at least yeah she she's moving in the right direction i think that's it's still a it's a bizarre and wrong-headed lens to be making your argument from let's uh let's snake back now uh and we'll go work mike back um this clip is from i heard it for the first time last night we were watching back to the future too my, my five-year-old boy loves the back to the futures which is based um and we were watching back to the future too and then i started getting friends and well-wishers sending me clips from matt frad's show yesterday pice with aquinas where he had a guy on whose last name is gormley i should put a put a picture of uh uh gormley up for for people who recognize him and he kept taking pod shots of me it's like a four and a half hour podcast i i don't i don't get the long form thing I, I i just never believe anyone will sit and listen to us for four and a half hours but it was a four and a half hour podcast and throughout it uh different people were saying hey every time gormley brought up your name i i took a little i took a little sound bite and sent it to you so here's one of them and he was saying oh tim gordon he's one of these guys that thinks wives should submit to husbands and Matt Frad kept defending me like consistently. And Matt, like I say, Matt Frad has a history of this. He, he's he's a balanced guy. Doesn't like going too far to either side. But he does not just let let his guests come on a show and trash a guy. And Matt admitted this to Gormley in one of Gormley's sort of attacks on the just sort of you know ipse dixit style attacks where he just says, "Oh, Tim Gordon, what a misogynist or some some bullshit." Here's what Matt said. But then the, yeah, 100%. But then the problem isn't with the scripture or with what right. the saints have taught about why wives ought to be submissive. I would say that I've actually changed my opinion somewhat on this through listening to some of the things Tim has said. Tim Gordon. Gordon. Yeah. His I, wife. Go ask your husband on Twitter. Yeah. yeah because I, uh, these are difficult topics to discuss. So this is good because in many ways, the ramp up to the book when I was writing it um, was announced on Matt Frad's show uh, in person four summers ago when he was still in Atlanta and it created quite a wave. And that wasn't such a huge account back then. He is, he is now. And um, I think it was one of his most viewed shows. Cause I'd said like, Hey, I just came from Disney world and I heard all these uh, chubby women yelling at their husbands. That's just what Steph and I kept, kept saying. And everyone went nuts, but a lot of people liked it. And I was like, well, the book's going to be out soon. So wait for it. Um, so it began with Matt and Matt saying four years later that he's convinced last time he had Trent Horn's wife on the show, he called Steph in Steph's book, ask your husband, a prophet. Um, he had the daily wire guys who have been, um, really pushing the case for patriarchy thesis hard, you know, that, that transgenderism has an originary form, which is feminism, Walsh and Knowles. He had uh, Walsh Knowles and Candace Owens' husband on the show, and they were talking about Catholic Republic and the thesis from a uh, case for patriarchy. And, and they were all talking it up. And, you know, like I'm closest with uh, Knowles of those guys, but I appreciate the support. It's, it's, it's not wrong to take a moment and say, well, thanks for the support and thanks for being open minded. And I know these ideas scared you. Four years ago and sounded abrupt and they're way countercultural, but thanks for keeping an open mind, Matt or Lila, or I think maybe, maybe Gormley eventually might get there. But who knows what Father Mike Schmitz will do? Uh, hopefully he'll do the right thing with the pushback that he's received this week. What do you, what do you guys say about kind of as a way of capping the show, a capstone? Well, isn't it good to take a moment and say, we've come thus far. 
undoing feminism, the hideous bitch goddess that's swallowed everything and given us transgender. And we need to go further, further. Uh, um, Hilltop by nightfall. What do you say, Mike? Yeah, I think that this is uh, a good, good sign of of things head, heading in the proper direction. I mean, there's still so much more to be done, but yeah, it does. These data points are favorable. Of you know, they're particularly what you said about the um, comment section against um, the uh, push. You know, push back against. Um, Father Mike Schmidt's clip. Um, so yeah, I think that these the truth and correctness of natural law and Catholic teachings, it's only going to get more obvious to men and especially women in the West as the insanity of the um LGBTQ, etc., gets even more pronounced. So I think in the coming years, you're you're gonna see even a more obvious and starker um demonstration of what right looks like and i think that half of our you know recruitment um uh, battle is going to be won by the left just by watching them go even more off the rails we we just need to stand and represent the truth the good and the beautiful and and, and just let let them go crazy elliot yeah it's cool to watch the pendulum swing uh, mainly from the ground up, the grassroots. You know, I'm curious though, and you know, this is, must be a topic for another time, but it seems as if, you know, Pope Francis's pontificate, of course, will be coming to an end at some point here soon. He's, he's old and, you know, and ill and things of that nature. But I can't help but to have this deep desire to see a big, like a Donald Trump Pope from the top really just stand for what we're really all about and lead us from the top. Uh, you know, uh, again, you know, like our whole conversation has been about, you know, honoring our fathers, it's patriarchy. And I understand the Pope's Pope. Um, but at the same time, you, we also mentioned the embarrassment from the top down. It's like, okay, yeah, but man, it'd be so nice if we had someone that we could really get behind and, and lead us right, and that others from the outside could look and say, "Man, those the Catholics are really now they're they're leading us." See, the problem with the Protestants is that there's no there is they can't be a Donald Trump, so they can't point out the the figurehead or 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 the the, the what's at the helm that represents the or is supposed to represent the the majority of the people for the all of Christendom for all Catholic, Christian or Protestant Catholics, whatever, everybody, it's always curious. Everybody always wants to know what is the Pope about? What is the Pope doing? And uh, I, I guess we just got to continue to pray many, many, many rosaries for a Pope that represents this kind of conversation and that can lead us into the next millennia with, uh, with true traditional Catholic masculine virtue. That's true. Especially with the synod upcoming at the end of the summer in October. Um, it really looms large. What is this Pope going, this ailing Pope going to do in his late pontificate? He's been a radical on the other side of things, pushing back against the change, the traditional. I mean, the, the stretch of the Overton window started when everyone, even normies, started going to the Latin Mass. So we had a liturgical rightward shift in the Overton window for, I guess, the first time in my life, liturgically, about five years ago. And really, we've been getting the fruits of the sec only second rightward shift in the Overton window with, with uh, culture, sex relations, particularly in the family that, you know, I've been striving at it for a few years, but we're really only seeing the fruits of it this year. Well, what, there is a connection between those two things. Mm -hmm. Pope Francis is so bad, so much worse than all the other bad popes. The conditions culturally and socially in places like England and America with the T in transgender are so bad that some people out there might be like, well, it's not you guys doing this work it's the conditions have gotten so bad that the zoomer generation they see it and they're like we want no part of it we want to go back to tradition maybe there's something to that mm -hmm. 
yeah, you, when you get an organized and determined minority, a vanguard, who make it their goal to capture an institution and bring about change from the top down, it's hard for a disorganized majority caught off guard to do much about it. And when you look at how some of the changes in the liturgy and some of the obfuscation of church teaching and bracketing of verses that don't fit the agenda have been carried out, you can see why people have taken a while to get their act together. But God does help those who help themselves and grace builds on nature. And a lot of the work that we can do as laymen is just patiently and faithfully labor in the fields, trying to get things right at ground level and then wait for grace to work as well. And that's a big part of what Tim's project has been about. And we can see it bearing fruit now in a way that we're all really thankful for. Well, thanks, Will. It's it's our project here at the Catholic Masculinity Project podcast. And I, I mean, I get so many so many off channel thanks for you guys and for what we're doing here on Fridays. It's not always here. You know, we float from our four channels uh, each of the Fridays, but it, it's not, it's they're They're not usually the most views. I just want to conclude with this thought. Will you, you did a beautiful tweet last night that I was like, this is after I was looking at all this kind of planning this show after back to the future too. You did this tweet that went like this. Um, let me find the damn thing. Uh, you said, why are you chasing likes? And this is a tweet, which is which it makes it twice as delicious. <laughs> why are you chasing likes? Barabbas got more likes than Christ did. I retweeted you, Will. you sort of Twitter master. And I quoted one of my intellectual heroes who I had the, the pleasure of meeting twice in life, a good good, good Catholic man and a certifiable genius who never got below an A in his whole life. He never made an A minus his entire life. He made straight A's from kindergarten through grad school. Uh, Justice Antonin Scalia, the revolutionary on the court, most important uh, uh, SCOTUS jurist in a hundred years. He said, have the courage to have your wisdom regarded as stupidity, which is what we're doing here, isn't it? Be fools for Christ. And have the courage to suffer the contempt of the sophisticated world. I said, thinking about Will's great tweet, the sophisticated world, or in the case of Twitter, a bunch of Kardashian idolizing IQ 95s, which is what it is on Twitter. As terrifying as it can be in a place like Mike, Mike came from Oxford, right? And was like, dude, these Oxford eggheads are going to regard my Christian wisdom as stupidity. Of course, he was only coming back into the faith then. It's more terrifying to submit your, your pearls before swine and say, here's, here's the truth. I'm trying to help you people. And then the hoi polloi out there, cut it up, munch it up, and, and you know say whatever they say about it. So I just, after, I don't know how long we've been at this, nine, nine months or so with the sea masks, eight months. But it's nice to have guys at your side. And that, that's how we're built. Because like when I first announced, hey, I'm writing this book against feminism, it's, it's going to be unpopular, but it's an overwhelming case. It is taking on the Cyclops, who's huge. Um, for three years after I announced it, wrote the book, released the book, my family got come after hard. It's really nice to do this podcast, which is, either more directly or more obliquely every Friday about this topic. It's nice to have you three gents standing shoulder to shoulder with me. Um, that's a personal note. Even if they're not are any of our most watched shows on our channel, because pretty much only men we're cutting off like half the population. Some, some really cool chicks actually do watch, but it's just, it feels like exercising the demons to do this once a week. So I just, that's why I'm extra grateful for you three Jointly and severally, each of you bring something really sweet and cool to the table. But then the mass of it, four dudes who each have really different but completely univocal perspectives is something to be grateful for. So I, I thank you guys very much. And um, um, I, you know, God, God bless you all. God bless America. 
God save the queen and everyone have a great, great Friday out there. Go read the comments in the father Mike video from two and a half days ago. It will send your Friday off. Right. Started off. Right. For those of you on the West coast anyway. Uh, well, Mike Elliott, thank you guys for being who you are and doing what you do. God bless you all. Me and Will are now on this return project. We're doing return matchmaking to start families out on the right foot. We're really excited about that. If you want to check out return matchmaking, going to retvrn.us. Like, subscribe, click the notification bell for this video. Have a great Friday. Deus, Volk. Peace, guys.